I want to start with your era of looking at companies on the mainland in China as prospective shorting opportunities for fraud to analyze their balance sheets. Are there still those opportunities or has that era ended? Well, it's interesting because I just want to point out before I was short on anything in China, I went there being very long. So I didn't go there thinking like this is all a fraud. Um, the answer to your question is yes and no, okay, in that there was never any real disincentive um, that got baked in for companies to stop defrauding U.S. investors. And fraud is, because China is an emerging market, fraud is just very prevalent in the environment. And we always forgot that as Western investors. We saw these tall, gleaming skyscrapers, and we'd eat at Western restaurants and Really, we were lulled into the sense of complacency that China functions like the West in many ways and not like an emerging market. So the fraud fraud is endemic, like many EMs, but we've never, in my view, gotten it out of the capital markets. Now, the companies that came to market in the prior decade and that really were the first ones to get washed out in 2010 to 2012 Okay, that, that was the low-hanging fruit. Those were the empty boxes that had no real business, and you could just surveil the factory gates and see that it, there was nothing there. What then happened was the businesses became largely, almost exclusively online businesses, and those are harder um, in order to prove fraud. Right. Now, we can look at a lot of these companies, do a tax rate analysis, and determine, and almost every single time we do it, that, yeah, there's fraud to some level in the financial statements. But it's harder for us to prove that to the satisfaction of U.S. investors. And since the U.S. still has literally no way to enforce or to investigate or enforce against the managements in China for defrauding U.S. investors, it's this asymmetry that was similar to the lead up to the financial crisis, which is, well, you know, if I lie to you, you being U.S. investors, um, nothing bad will happen to me. And the possibility is, I mean, I used to say I could make tens of millions of dollars. That's chunk change in you know, today's valuations, yeah. but hundreds of millions, maybe even billions of dollars on the back of my lies. Why wouldn't I do that? So that has never been addressed in a substantive way. So when I do look at the universe of especially US listed China companies, and we do these tax analyses, we just come up with fraud pretty much top to bottom. All right. So do you have any current targets that you're looking at or certain uh, companies that stand out? Well, the other dynamic that has occurred, so the short answer is no, not. I mean, we're always looking at some stuff in China. But we, after GSX last year, so we were short GSX. It's like a bunch of other people were short GSX publicly. It's an empty box, near total fraud. I mean, that stock just got jammed up on us twice. Now, obviously, some portion of that was Arch Ego's Bill Huang, but that really did hit home or bring something home to me that about what had changed in the, at that point, 10 years I'd been shorting China frauds. Back when I started doing this, the people on the other side were not market savvy at all, and they didn't know how, they didn't understand how stocks traded. Today, I think there's a lot of manipulation of these stocks, and not just the China stocks. I mean, I think that using HFT type techniques, I mean, which are so far beyond the capability of regulators to understand and, and suss out when there's manipulation, I think there are a number of stocks that you could call manipulated at least at times, but especially in the China space. So we, you know, we could be convinced it's a fraud. But the question becomes, does it matter? And to be fair, we ask this question about non-China-based companies all the time now, just um, you know, this many years into this monetary policy-fueled bull market. But that's the thing with China. You might have a fraud, but I mean, we were actually having serious conversations last year about whether we should be long some of these, especially the ones that were in the, like, the, the ESG-type indices. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it, you know, that's, it's just a strange time. Sorry to cut you off, but I, before we continue with China, 
You seem to be vaguely referencing perhaps the meme trading phenomenon in the United States, the Reddit traders, the idea of the Robin Hood and what that's opened up, the sort of irrational trading seemingly based on the fundamentals in specific names. How challenging does it make your job to seek out the fundamentals, to seek out, you know, balance sheet mismatches that seem not to matter if somebody just has a right hashtag on a, a chain? Well, so I think that, that, to me, the bigger issue, but it does dovetail with what you're talking about, is the prevalence of passive investing in the market. Because what ends up happening, and I didn't appreciate this until really late last year, or early this year, when you have passive buyers of more and more of the float, it doesn't create a linear upward effect on stock prices. It creates a convex upward impact on stock prices. So then you layer on top of that, retail buying of out of the money calls to create this these gamma squeezes and yeah and and so you just get this crazy uh, disconnect in a number of stocks between the actual economic fundamentals and what the stock prices are doing now the saving grace for people such as myself that when it comes to meme stocks um, they advertise it openly that they're going to squeeze it so we are no longer ignoring that, uh, or we're very attuned to where retail yeah. traders are talking these things up. So we don't have so much capital that we can't get out of the way, knock wood. So I'm not so much worried about that, but it's the it's the d distortion of passive buying on really just a lot of crap companies and sometimes abject frauds, especially from China, that to me, that's the more disturbing issue. Well, but how do you then engage with this? How do you uh, make money? Do you stay away altogether? Or when you said that, you know, basically they're advertising what they're going to do, and then you can play with that, how? Well, so we're not yet playing, we're not playing long squeezes um, on meme stocks. But what, you know, good, a good example of how we utilize this um, was XL Fleet. That's a company that we shorted earlier this year. It's a SPAC you know, close to an empty box, basically, in our view. And the stock had gone down and we made money on it. Now, we're very quick to pull the trigger on getting out of something if we have to. So we saw all of a sudden retail traders talking it up. There was a bunch of buying of out of money uh, call options, and we just covered our short entirely. Turns out the stock did not squeeze. So, you know, but better safe than sorry. So that's how we're utilizing it. Um, on top of that, we run our book generally market neutral. So for every dollar short a name, we're going long to hedge it. And we're going long rather than just indices. We're going long what are called factors or factor baskets. So for every short position, we might have 30 to 50 uh, tiny long positions that we think will explain most of the beta there. So. That's how we've changed our business to keep up with the times. In the meantime, there's also this concern that you could have meme traders in the United States and over in China, you could have massive policy shifts that suddenly start to change entire industries. We saw that with the semiconductors today as people were concerned about potential uh, accusations of price manipulation from uh, regulators in China. You've also seen this with milk formula <laughs> and other areas. How do you get a sense of what the next area they might be targeting could be? Do you try to play in any of that, or does that make it nearly uninvestable for you? Because it's not about fundamental research. It's based on something that cannot be predicted. Well, that's the point. It can't be predicted. And I think that investors for the past decade were basically you know, pulling the wool over their own eyes on the capriciousness of the policy environment in China. So those that's coming home now to bite a number of investors. But... I mean, it's just one of many risks that you really need to take into account, but investors have not. Um, and it's another reason why all other things being equal, a China stock should trade at a significant discount relative to a stock that's from a company that's based in the US. But often we've we found that they don't because investors like to tell themselves these fairy tales about, it, there's this tremendous cognitive dissonance, always has been with China. They'll, investors will say, well, you know, it's growing really quickly. We think that the real GDP growth print will be 7% this year. And I'd say, but you know that that's not real data. I mean, you know that that's, you know, that there's inaccuracy and then lying embedded in that and nobody actually takes that seriously. Yes, but we have to be long because it's going to grow 7% a year. So 
it's cognitive dissonance. Yeah. We live in this world where, in, where investors are forced to allocate more and more money to the equity markets by low interest rates, financial repression, and they take on more risk and in my view are not adequately compensated for it. And you see that at moments like these.